to our final design at large lecture for this algorithms and ethics quarter. I'm super excited to welcome Pinar Yoldash, who's a brand new faculty member who's part of the visual arts department and is a speculative designer. Uh, Pinar's Twitter actually describes, you chose these words for yourself, eco-futurist and over-designer. So I'm going to be excited to learn what that is. Um, I was really excited to have Pinar come talk to us because she's someone I've known for almost 10 years as an artist, a designer, but also a really fearless interdisciplinarian. Um, she won a bronze medal in organic chemistry in the National Science Olympics. <laughs> and had a solo painting exhibition when she was five. Um, she did a PhD in media arts and sciences at Duke, uh, but with a cognitive neuroscience emphasis. And before that, she did a master's of fine arts at UCLA in design and media arts. So she's someone who's working through uh, the kinds of predicaments we get ourselves into as societies with biology, neuroscience, artificial intelligence, but in really playful ways that we can never get through thinking just with science and engineering alone. So thank you so much for coming and teaching us and provoking us, and uh, we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much. Lily, let's just get this to work first. Is it working? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Um, well, thank you, Lily and Scott, for inviting me here. Um, I just started again in January, so this is my first official talk in campus, so I'm kind of nervous. It's also because this is a talk that I prepared only for your eyes only, so it's brand new, although I'm going to talk about some old projects. Uh, do you really want me to explain eco-futurists <laughs> and over-designer? I don't have slides for them, actually. <laughs> and you know when you don't have slides, you're naked, like you can't really talk anymore because there's nothing to back up, but we'll get back to that. Um, so, um, yeah, the title of the talk today is Causality is Broken, and this comes from um, uh, a process, an intensive process, uh, during my uh, dissertation at Duke. I was uh, looking at uh, this notion of the Anthropocene, and it took me to this, and we're going to look at that today. And some key concepts we're going to cover is basically Anthropocene, uh, Umwelt, this notion of Umwelt. In German, it means environment, uh, but not in the like environmental sciences uh, kind of environment, uh, imperceptibility and causality and uh, projects related to these concepts. So what is going on here? <coughs> Did I hear something? Hopefully he's taking it back. Yes, he is taking it back. Yeah. Um, so any other thoughts about what's happening here? What kind of uh, organisms are in the picture, for instance? A dolphin, yes. It's a dolphin. Um, this is Scotland. And, and the, the uh, man in the picture is an MMA fighter, mixed martial arts fighter, Cattle Pendred. Uh, he finds the beach dolphin as he's like enjoying a nice afternoon uh, by the beach. And uh, the dolphin um, beaches out because it's uh, extremely hot, abnormal temperatures, water is very hot, dolphin can't take it anymore uh, out on the beach. Cattle sees the dolphin, grabs the dolphin and takes it uh, directly back to the ocean, something which I wouldn't be able to do because it's probably a very heavy uh, animal. Uh, and the first thing uh, he does, I, I, I find this very uh, symbol, uh, symptomatic of uh, the whole notion of Anthropocene. And the first thing he does after <laughs> taking the dolphin to the ocean is to tweet about it, right? And he also has an Instagram post. Uh, he says, I just spent an hour in the sea at Dunbeck uh, trying to save a baby dolphin. He was very hurt but alive and well now. What he doesn't know in this, while posting about this, is that when you find a beach dolphin, a sea mammal of that scale, you should probably inspect the dolphin to see what the problem is, because they have a blowhole, they have lungs, they have all kinds of complicated machinery in there. And um, this is the next tweet. Sad news. Uh, the Irish whale and dolphin group have said that to the young dolphin washed up in Dunbeck again last night. I tried my best. So um, yeah, this is a very... Uh, Emblem uh, symbolic of what's going on in the Anthropocene, but let's actually remember what the Anthropocene is in a more scientific way. So uh, it is uh, this term that's not officially accepted by geologists yet, but it's been 
a buzzword almost uh, that we use to imply mankind's negative impact on Earth's ecosystems. The origins of the word, however, are uh, coming from this awesome guy, Paul Jacobson, who's uh, written this text. It's very short. I recommend everyone in this room reads it. Geology of Mankind. And here he basically claims that uh, up till this point, geologists would gather to decide on what epoch was happening. And uh, their decision making would be based on the biggest, most impactful force on the face of the Earth at that time. This could be earthquakes, this could be uh, temperature, whatnot. And there, in that meeting, in one meeting around 2001, they decided that the biggest force on the face of the planet, the biggest natural force is mankind itself, therefore the Anthropocene. Um, a side note about Paul Kurtzson, he's at UCSD. So um, <coughs> now the next concept we're moving on to is this Umwelt concept uh, by Jacob von Uckskull. And um, Jacob von Uckskull unfortunately isn't at UCSD, he's dead. Uh, he's a biosemiotician who came up with this notion of uh, uh, meaning making in the biological world. So up to his book, A Foray into the World of uh, Animals and Man, um, no one really thought about how organisms made meaning in, in their world, made meaning of the world. And uh, in this diagram he mentions, this is actually in German, the original one, uh, he talks about receptor organs, mark organs that like receive information and action organs or effector organs that um, you know, uh, do something, take action in response to this, uh, uh, the, the stimuli. So this is a cycle, and that's the book. Now, uh, another thing he talks about is that these, this uh, cycle between perceptual organs and the action organs of an organism create a bubble, which he calls the umwelt. So this bubble is basically what we all inhabit. So. I don't know how many organisms are there in this room, but probably maybe 50, I don't know, 45. Uh, I can't really count just by looking at things like Rain Man. But um, there are many organisms, and there are as many umwelts, bubbles, as the number of organisms, because we all build our world uh, using our perception and action organs, right? He gives the example, to elaborate on this concept a little bit more, he gives the example of a tick, so how many sensory organs or uh, receptors does a tick have? Two. What would they be? Smell. Five. Uh, maybe let's just talk about the, uh, the senses themselves. So smell is correct. The tick can smell, but can only smell one thing. And um, that's butyric acid. The tick can also feel pressure, right? So it can tell if it lands on something. Uh, it can tell if whatever it's landing on has butyric acid or not. It can also sense temperature, which is the temperature of a mammal, right? The ticks are not just after humans. They, they want all kinds of food. As long as uh, it's, uh, the body possesses 36.5 degrees Celsius of temperature and is a mammal, which is, you know, butyric acid is this like um, kind of smell uh, that all mammals generate. So when these three stimuli are present in the uh, tick's umwelt, what does it do? It takes action, right? And actually, if these stimuli aren't present in the tick's umwelt, the tick will, can wait, and it can wait up to 18 years without any action. So um, von Uxkill uh, describes tick's umwelt very beautifully. The very poverty of this world guarantees the unfailing certainty of her actions, and security is more important than wealth. So that's the tick's umwelt for you. Now, how about us? We have temperature, and we also uh, can sense like a varying spectrum of uh, different temperatures. We have multiple temperature sens uh, pressure sensors. We have really excellent sight. We can taste things. We have audition, nociception proprioception, right? Um, let's go back to this. If I'm forgetting anything, it's because this whole five senses, uh, humans have five senses, is a myth. We have as many senses as the number of receptors we possess. So I just kind of grouped them. And um, yes? Can you just explain proprioception? A bunch of people might not know, and 
That will kind of heighten. Okay. Anyone, anyone, anyone who knows what proprioception is? Position. Yeah, it's basically balance and the, this bodily feeling of where your body is. And uh, a lot of people use skateboards and one wheels and whatnot. So without proprioception, everybody will be falling left and right. So um, that's proprioception. Now, I made a very simple bubble diagram of umwelts of different species here, okay? And I just focused on um, uh, audition, hearing, because uh, it's very hard to compare organisms umwelt to each other, like how can you compare pear to apple kind of question, because we are all possessed, we all, uh, we're all endowed with different types of receptors. And here we see the whale, it's the blue whale, whose uh, umwelt is so large that it can actually hear uh, uh, sounds that are over a thousand miles away, right? Um, actually, a hundred thousand <coughs> miles away. Am I correct? Yes. Thousands. Yeah, thousands. Okay, I mean it up. All right, and it can do <laughs> infrasound, and it can also go up to like these numbers are correct. Actually, uh, one hundred twenty uh, thousand hertz. Now, uh, elephants are also very impressive in the way they can hear things, and they can go up to one hundred fifty miles away. Uh, the, if there's rain, they can detect this. And uh, for us, it was hard to get like correct numbers because there isn't. I couldn't really find a comparative, you know, anatomical chart that does a very legit uh, uh, comparison under the same conditions because we don't inhabit the same conditions, right? Uh, fluids uh, uh, convey a sound much easily, dot, dot, dot. Uh, but for us, there are uh, papers which claim that we can hear up to 300 meters, 500 meters, and it depends on like the humidity and the type of the sound, etc. But we do not have the same range as these other animals. And the tick actually doesn't have hearing, so it should have been like a tiny little dot. So these... But we can see... Pardon light. me? We can see light that's billions of miles away. We can. We can. We can see. Uh, we, we have better sight than hearing. We have better sight than hearing, and we possess a very huge uh, visual cortex at the back of our brains, which is almost like a sec small brain in the brain. So there is that. But um, this is just to give an example of how different animals build their worlds differently. And uh, again, uh, another thing that I found out is while looking at the whale audition, for instance, um, their hearing capacities shrank because of the anthropogenic forces in the ocean. Now they can't communicate as far. Right now their world, the, the radius of their umwelt shrank. So um, some things, now we have the bubble. I hope everyone kind of understood this concept of bubble, the beautiful concept by Jacob von Uxkill. Now some things that fall beyond our hum human umwelt some things that we can't really detect right away, right? And then um, we use tools or extensions to expand our umwelt. So what other stimuli falls beyond our umwelt? What's the VOC? Uh, it's volatile organic compounds, uh, which is um, an air pollutant, like benzene, uh, butadiene, 1.4, something, something. I'm blanking on the names right now. but. Uh, this is a good question to think about. There are a lot of stimuli out there uh, that we cannot sense, that does not uh, register into our umwelt. And here's the concept of the imperceptible. What falls beyond our umwelt, umwelt becomes imperceptible. Uh, this is Newton's cradle. I was actually going to bring one, but I forgot. And now my claim in this talk is that what falls beyond our umwelt, what becomes imperceptible uh, to us, also um, uh, suffers from uh, this breakdown of causality. So causality is broken by imperceptibility. <coughs> now I have a very simple diagram of Newton's cradle. Cause and effect, right? Cause and effect, cause and effect, and we're very good at this. This is a part of our uh, developmental process to detect cause and effect. And uh, then there are things where cause and effect are imperceptible to us. This is the cause of something. The next slide I'm going to show. But what is happening here? This is a um, page, a spread from 
uh, Life magazine 1955. Mm -hmm. I actually just saw an, an issue of National Geographic this month and they used the same image and I was like, yes, I've been using this since 2013 and now they're using it too. Great. Um, this is a very celebratory moment of, the, uh, uh, of a time where disposable consumerism is first introduced in our culture. Right, 1955, you won't be able to read this. It's imperceptible to you, so I'm going to read it. The objects flying through the air in this picture would take 40 hours to clean, except that no housewife need bother. Right, by using disposable items, the article claims, you can cut down on house chores, which you can then spend on uh, fun activities like shopping. Now, this is the cause, and this is the effect. Is this image familiar to you? This is uh, by photographer Chris Jordan, a really cool artist who is also doing a documentary on the same subject matter of Liz and Albatross. And uh, this image is from 19, uh, 2006, where uh, he went to Midway, this island in the middle of Pacific Ocean, and uh, found these uh, Liz and Albatross and other marine birds whose uh, decay reveals that uh, the death of Kozo's, uh, cause is plastics. Uh, this is an image that also uh, documents this uh, ultimate fusion of nature and culture, right? And that's cause and effect, but all the intermediary steps are out of our uh, umwelt. So plastic bottle, okay, mass consumption and accumulation. So it's not going to, one plastic bottle won't kill a marine bird, obviously, but uh, it's gathering over time and it uh, ends up in the oceans and it leads to uh, the death of a dead albatross, uh, of an albatross chick. In fact, um, I just found a recent um, paper which claims that 98% of lazy albatross chicks have, are fed uh, regurgitated uh, plastic uh, uh, by their mothers. So for us, this middle part is missing, right? And this breaks causality. Now, the, the thing is if, Every time I drank uh, from a plastic bottle, a bunch of laser albatross fell on me, right? Then I would actually probably think more about using plastic bottles because it would be happening right here in, my, in the middle of my umwelt and it would be messy and it would hurt. Mm -hmm. And um, this, these are numbers from 2012. One million seabirds were died because of plastics. And again, I just mentioned this. Um, there are some papers who claim that all the marine birds alive have plastics in their bodies today. Another example is from Almeria, Spain. This is the capital of greenhouse farming. And this, is, this city is also the biggest supplier of uh, fresh produce to uh, chain, supermarket chains in Europe and uh, Britain. Now, um, this, is, this kind of shows an overview. I read somewhere that it's 40,000 acres of greenhouse uh, plastics is used for this. And this is another image. They're not this pretty eco-friendly greenhouses that you, you would see at Home Depot or elsewhere. And uh, this is a recent image of a sperm whale that beached out around Spain. And uh, it was revealed that there was 70 kil 17 kilograms of plastic sheets mm -hmm. coming from greenhouse uh, 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 structures around the area. And uh, there are numbers, there are no uh, real number, in real meaning there are no legit numbers that I could find, but uh, they say up to uh, 300 uh, whales are affected by this. Some numbers are higher, some numbers are lower. Another recent one was just last month, 69 kilograms of plastic sheets was in its digestive tract. Again, if every time we, you know, munched on a fresh uh, grape tomato from a greenhouse uh, structure, a whale fell on us, <laughs> we wouldn't be, we would be thinking more about that, right? So it's not like, oh, we're consuming these things and the cause is leading to the effect right away and we're not taking action. It's actually happening outside our umwelt, so it breaks our causality. 
Now, uh, another thing I want to show is, again, another, I guess, maybe psychological proof of how this works is Jean Piaget's object permanence. So up to six or eight months, and sometimes even later, sometimes earlier, babies would um, uh, have this, uh, they would lose track of the objects as long as uh, when you take the object uh, from their sight. So out of sight, out of mind. If you show a baby, let's say, a toy animal, and then hide it uh, behind you, the baby won't think that the toy animal is present anymore. It's gone, right? So uh, I think this is what, I, I believe most climate deniers are stuck in this phase, to be honest. <coughs> and I want to play you this. When you long form public affairs programming from the nation's capital, and the public service of your television provider, CSAC, created by the in case we have forgotten, because we keep hearing that 2014 has been the worst oh, year on record, <laughs> I asked the chair, do you know what this is? It's a snowball, and it's just from outside here. So it's very, very cold out, very unseasonable, so we've been trying to catch this. He's very, very proud of himself. Um, <laughs> Now, the challenge uh, for us uh, designers and cultural producers is how can we bring the imperceptible back to our own world? The real challenge is can we design a new culture that addresses these as uh, design problems, actually, or perceptual problems or aesthetic problems? Uh, can we design new cultures? It doesn't have to be a monolithic culture that solves everything, right? It can be localized, it can be different, but can we really uh, design this? And again, another claim I want to make with through, uh, within the confinements of this talk is culture is malleable, and back to this image, there was no such thing as disposable consumerism in, uh, before 1955. Now it's what, 65 years later, about 65 la years later, this has become a predator in our oceans. Plastic has become a predator in our oceans and it's causing all kinds of um, ecosystem problems, right? But this also become a very um, prominent part of our everyday lives and our culture. But this didn't exi exist uh, in 1955. So culture actually evolves and it evolves much faster than we think. So we can reverse it. This is actually a good thing that culture evolves this way. Think of smoking, for instance. Again, smoking was popularized 40s, 50s, then it's depopularized, and now no one smokes, right? <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> now, um, at this point of the talk, I want to give some examples from my own practice. I think I have three projects. Uh, I have been trying to devise methodologies to uh, you know, address this problem of imperceptibility and how it breaks causality and bringing uh, you know, the imperceptible back to our umwelt using art, installation, architecture. Uh, the first project is an ecosystem of excess and um, I basically think it was around 2007 or 8 where I took the seat where I placed myself in the seat at the bottom of the ocean. This is a plastic chair six kilometers down in the benthic area of the ocean where most 60% uh, of plastic sinks. And I sat there and I thought about it. Uh, this looks like a beautiful star field, but it's actually uh, microplastics mixed with ocean plankton. And um, I was um, terrified and also like impressed by this phenomenon called Pacific uh, Trash, uh, Pacific trash vortex. I believe everyone in this room is familiar with this. Are you guys, are you all familiar with Pacific trash vortex? Yes? Yes? Who doesn't know about Pacific trash vortex? Great! I had the opportunity to, to show you guys what this is. So, Pacific trash vortex is, um, let's say, the largest and most dynamic monument that we've created globally. Uh, to plastics, for plastics. And it's uh, taking place in one of the five gyres in the Pacific Ocean, uh, one of the largest ecosystems in the ocean. And it's basically uh, a locus where 80% uh, of uh, plastics from land makes it way to. It takes about six years uh, for waste uh, released from these you know, countries around it to make it to the gyre. 
and uh, it was first discovered by a Captain Charles Moore. I'm going to talk about him more. And uh, again, let's remember this image from Life magazine, 1955. No disposable plastics. This is actually the aftermath of them cleaning the photo shoot. Oh, I actually want to show this image again because uh, can you see the, ch the, the child in this picture? There's a girl in this picture, right? There are three people in this picture. I found that it's very ironic that her face is obscured by a uh, flying piece of plastics, and she, in this image, represents the future, right? Now, another uh, beautiful imagery from another lifestyle magazine. This is literally a monument to nylon. Uh, another beautiful slogan from House Beautiful magazine, and these are also the first lifestyle magazines. Before this time, there were no magazines which told you how to live your life in style. And uh, the claim is you will have a greater chance to be yourself than any people in the history of civilization. And as of 2018, we have become more of ourselves than any person in the history of civilization. This is, uh, again, let's remember Chris Jordan. More images of uh, negative sublime. So these are from the BP oil spill, actually. And the connection between petroleum and plastics is obvious. Uh, while I was looking at the sad imagery of uh, dead or animals that are in the process of dying, I found these two images, and I thought they were actually very hopeful. Uh, because you witness a war between polymers, keratin, a natural polymer, and HDP, a synthetic polymer. And what do we see here? we see that life adopts and life wins. They might be suffering from terrible digestive problems, but they're alive. Then um, Captain Charles Moore is the discoverer of Pacific uh, Trash Vortex. Uh, so he's um, a local captain who started a, 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 an institution, a foundation called Algalita in San Diego. And around 1997, on his way to Hawaii, I believe, or on his way back, he takes a different route and he sees all these like plastic waste uh, floating in the surface of the ocean. And for miles and miles, it doesn't disappear. So he decides to turn it into a citizen science experiment where he starts collecting samples and he detects microplastics in the, in the water. And um, the, the size of the site is unknown. Some say it's twice the size of Texas. Some say it's as big as France. Uh, we don't know the numbers. All we know is that it's expanding. And in this image, he's holding a sample. It's actually an interview by him where he says, the ocean has turned into a soup. This is the soup. And um, while I was watching that video, and when I heard the word soup, I immediately thought about the primordial soup theory, right? Uh, three billion years ago, life starts in the oceans. We have to see that number again. Okay, they, uh, they, they're timed that way. Uh, 3.8 billion years ago, life starts in the uh, salty wombs of uh, the ocean, right? And the question I ask with this project is, what if life started now in today's oceans in our contemporary primordial soup of plastics? And uh, the first piece in the exhibition is uh, the soup. So uh, this uh, piece was inspired by Susan Frankel's book, uh, Plastics, A Toxic Love Story. And in that book, she lists all the objects she touches from the moment she starts her day in the morning uh, until like noon or something. So um, I basically went around and like chipped away these things she listed, such as the alarm clock, the, uh, the, uh, the kettle, uh, the mug, uh, the, the car door handle, uh, you name it. We, we touch plastics all the time. And I put them in this uh, stirrer, magnetic stirrer, and it was just there, rotating, like do doing the vortex for many months. I also sprinkled some pre-plastic production pellets in it. And after a couple months, we got this bacteria to emerge in the soup. And I worked with a microbiologist uh, to analyze them. And uh, I was excited. I was like, maybe a new species. No, it's just regular bacteria uh, that just grew there. But then there is also bacteria that evolved in uh, Pacific trash vortex. This is very new, uh, new organisms. And um, 
I started a co correspondence with Linda Emerald Zettler, who published this article where she defines the plastosphere. Uh, the plastosphere is a collection of microorganisms, symbionts, heterotrophs that uh, live on plastics, feed off of plastics, and uh, they, they have basically merged. And uh, she was, they were very uh, reluctant to, to uh, present this as a solution to plastic <coughs> pollution because we actually don't know whether the bacteria is creating toxic outputs, etc. But they have evolved successfully. And these are some SEM images of the bacteria that they found. And all I had to do was, um, now that I challenged myself with the design of an ecosystem to extrapolate from that, OK, the bacteria is there already, so what other life forms can come out of it? So I looked at insects. And um, this is a paper uh, published by Miriam Goldstein. This is actually a student scientist. She published this paper when she was 18 where she showed that um, because of the presence of microplastics in the Pacific trash vortex, now we see more and more aquatic insects living there. Normally, aquatic <coughs> insects don't like the open ocean because they can't lay their eggs on anything. There's no substrate. But uh, she proved that insects are moving to this new territory. And um, starting with that, I imagined new insects that made uh, like uh, plastic-rich eggs which would become nutrient for other life forms in the ecosystem. Uh, then I moved to the Nurdle Beach. Uh, Nurdles are the colloquial name given to pre-plastic production pellets. And this is actually um, the building blocks of plastics. Anything that you know is plastics probably was uh, Nurdles at some point, right? That's how we make plastics. We add plasticizers and color and other things and we get different textures and uh, different uh, qualities of material, but that's how they start. That's how we start making plastics. But nurdles are also important because they are the number one beach contaminants. Uh, they escape the corporate boundaries of the factory and find their way to the beaches. And they're very hard to clean because they're tiny. They're also called mermaid tears. And the question to ask is, are these tears of joy or tears of sorrow? So I started thinking about uh, Nurdles and what kind of life forms would like to live on a Nurdle beach? It's obviously full of uh, plastics, nutrient rich environment. And I thought of uh, Pacific uh, balloon turtle. And Pacific balloon turtle is also inspired by another paper where uh, the scientist shows that a hungry marine turtle, when given the option between clear plastics and colored plastics, which primarily comes from balloons, almost always opts for the balloon. So their preferred non-food is balloons. So I thought to myself, if they keep eating this eon for eons and eons, maybe in a Lamarckian twist, they'll um, de uh, evolve an inflatable elastic bag, just like a balloon, that can inflate and deflate, which can also serve uh, as a survival advantage because the sea levels are rising, they'll have to swim more. It can also become a fitness indicator. Um, this is a species that I'm not going to talk about. And this is a species that lives at the benthic area where the chair was, remember, that's uh, actually really good for a plastosphere creature because there's so much plastics in there. And this reptile lays its eggs there uh, uh, in the beginning of its life cycle. The eggs are, uh, you know, red because it's a good color to adopt if you're uh, living at the very uh, depths of the ocean. But over time, they get... Uh, lighter and lighter and they start floating and they make their way to the Nurdle Beach and they can adopt to this new environment. Now the last species on my uh, list is Aves birds. And again, I was looking at pigmentation in, uh, the, in the animal world and um, there is a, a positive correlation, not for all organisms, but for some organisms like flamingos, there is a positive correlation between what you eat and the colors you manifest. Uh, flamingos eat krill, they attain their beautiful color from it. So I said, well, if um, a lot of marine birds are ingesting, like all marine birds are ingesting bottle caps right now, and a uh, side note here, just like uh, the balloon turtle likes balloons, uh, birds always prefer bottle caps. Um, if bottle caps end up in their digestive tract, may maybe after eons of eating this, they'll start manifesting corporate colors, Pantone <laughs> colors. 
So uh, here we have a Coca-Cola red bird, we have an Evian pink bird, we have a Dasani blue bird, right? And they all have the Pantone code. And um, this is a traveling exhibition, so every time we show it in a different context, like the colors slightly change. This is from China, and this was a local brand that they had, so now we have that beautiful pink added to our collection. And uh, finally, in this exhibition, um, in this installation, uh, for this ecosystem, I had to think about where energy is coming from and how it's metabolized. So energy is coming from plastics, and I need to find where uh, the, the source of plastics is. Um, so I thought of sense organs. This is a P plastoceptor. So um, it follows principle of principles of um, uh, quantum biomechanics, and it detects plastics, uh, mostly pro propylene. And uh, it looks like this. Uh, this is e plastoceptor. So, plastoceptors are organs just like the eye detects photons, they can detect uh, polymer chains. And e plastoceptor detects polyethylene, which is the most abundant plastics in the ocean. Uh, these are some diagrams for them. This is Stomaximus, it's a maximized stomach for the plastivore where, uh, remember the bacteria that they discovered? This bacteria can live in these tiny little vesicles, of the vesicles of the, in the organ, and then this organ can break down up to 13 different types of plastics, such as nylon, acrylic, HDP, LDP, PP, PE, you name it, right? Um, and that's that. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip petronephros, which is basically a kidney, and it takes out um, BPAs uh, from the plastics because BPAs are super toxic and even in an environment where uh, organisms eat plastics, this is gonna kill them. And uh, this is a, a digestive system for birds. And this is how we had the installation. Um, a father looking at the plastosphere organs holding his baby. And um, we also, in certain iterations, I had uh, data visualizations of uh, the top manufacturers of plastics, the top countries that contribute to uh, the vortex, and number of uh, life that's affected by this. Uh, this is an installation in the Polytechnicum Science Museum in Moscow. So it's been traveling. It actually came to UCSD too last year. Now, I'm moving to another project um, called SCREAM a homage to Edward Munch and all the dead raccoons. This is a very old project from 2007, 2008. It's a responsive voting machine. Uh, I was a student at UCLA and the elections were about to happen and um, I was doing Arduino work, uh, physical computing work, and we were asked to make a machine that responds to uh, the inputs coming from the voter and uh, the inspiration for the machine was Rube Goldberg and his complicated machinery. So every student would have a Rube Goldbergian machine that responded to the vote. So I put everything together and I came up with this beautiful painting by Edward Munch. I was like, I'm going to do this. This is also the only painting which has its own emoticon. <laughs> and uh, here I need sound for this one and I'm not sure how to actually turn on the sound. Uh, so I made um, a raccoon skull scream every time someone voted for the Republicans. <laughs> it's going to be not as loud as I want, but let's just go for it. Consecutive votes lead to a longer scream. If the frequency is high, it leads to a louder scream. So there are all these like um, parameters to it. Now I made this, 
But then I wasn't satisfied. I wanted more skulls to scream. <laughs> and um, around the time I applied for a science grant, luckily I got it. They thought my project was scientific, yes. And I made, I made a very loud chamber orchestra for endangered species where I made 14 skulls that belong to 14 endangered species scream. So the whole idea was that environmental pollution data sets are available and they're there, CO2 emission uh, information is available and it's there, but we considered cold data. It's hard for a non-scientist or uh, just a layperson or even a tired scientist, you know, cognitive load and all of that, to interpret this data and to do something about it, to, to, you know, respond to it in an emotional way. And me and my team thought maybe we can turn it into a multimodal aesthetic experience. So the idea was that we take CO2 emission data from the World Bank together with other types of emotion, uh, uh, pollution data and then we sonify it and sonification is just like data visualization visualiz visualizes data, sonification sonifies data and then we would composite it with sound recordings of these endangered species because some of them are very touching actually, like the wolf or the dolphin or the whale. And then um, we would sync it with the screens screaming, uh, skulls screaming. At the cranial unit, these are the list of species represented. Uh, some of our fashion shoots. Uh, I actually went around the campus and asked for labs to donate me skulls also because I couldn't find all the skulls I wanted. I fought really hard to get a gorilla skull. Uh, I'm uh, very proud to own an orca skull. And we uh, measured them, uh, calculated the weight of the mandible and, you know, picked the right motor, dot, dot, dot. So there was a lot of, like, engineering that went into this. And uh, this is insulation. I'm sorry, there is actually a film, but without the sound, it won't make much sense. So I'm just going to um, go through it very fast. Uh, we basically um, picked 14 uh, speakers and used an interface device, which would take our input and uh, send the uh, sound to the speakers separately, uh, that so that the audience would be in the middle and the speakers would be uh, outside and you see the speakers there, and the sound would really be traveling around. It will come from your rear back, it will be coming from the back, coming from the left. So it was a really immersive uh, sound experience. Um, again, our sound in this setup is crippled, so I'm just going to make the whale say hi to you here. You can see them. So that was their uh, part where dolphin and whale were uh, sonifying water pollution data. And we had a climactic end where all the animals were screaming. Um, and I, even if I initiated the project, and we can't get that here, uh, when they all started screaming, it really gave everyone goosebumps. All right. All right, now moving on to something more fresh, new, more California. Global Warming Hot Yoga Studio. Uh, this is a new project and uh, this is actually one of the last projects I want to show. Um, I was practicing uh, Bikram uh, to deal with the stresses of writing a dissertation and in a very hot Bikram session I thought to myself, we, what if the, the light, the, the heat of the studio came from a sign that read global warming? What if every time I practiced, I actually got heat literally from global warming? Because remember the senator and his problem with the s throwing the snowball and all of that? So um, I basically uh, designed a stage. Uh, the funding came from an institution in Sweden, so they put me in this location. Um, when you pick, uh, so I picked these uh, infrared lamps and one infrared lamp is not that warm actually when you uh, use it. 
-hmm. It's used in massage therapy. You can point it to your neck, etc., to relieve pain. Uh, so it wasn't that hot, but we had 300 of them. <laughs> so I was very confident that this would work. But <laughs> given the fact that it's Sweden in the fall and that we're in a loft with no any heating whatsoever, it didn't work. <laughs> and people really had to go very close to get any uh, heat whatsoever. And I was, I was you know, uh, heartbroken after all the effort and the money that went into this. Um, but then the installation moved to uh, Brussels and we did the uh, whole practice there where they put it in a more confined space. And then I started getting text messages from the yoga teacher thanking me for creating this beautiful experience because apparently they all sweated a lot and it was very different for them to practice in this global warming yoga studio. The catch is um, the instructor, you know, with most westernized yoga practices, there's a script that the teacher follows and it's usually like, relax, um, exhale. So she was going through asanas while following a more regular yoga script uh, and then she would mix lines like inhale all the particulate matter around you. And uh, I, I'm sorry we can't really hear her speak but um, there were three or four asanas, there was a tree pose where uh, you imagine yourself being a part of this big forest and you send your roots down uh, to the ground and you touch the groundwater which is full of lead and you pull it back in. Yeah, so... Um, this is a script, you are a tree in the big forest of humanity, you send your roots deep down to reach groundwater, polluted by biocides, heavy metals, nitrates, lead. So the yoga teacher is, in, is basically following the script that's going between relaxation, letting go of daily thoughts, focusing on yourself, creating this inner space, and this rather twisted way of informing or giving, uh, like providing um, global warming information dump to the practitioner, right? So that was the practice. And um, now the last project. Uh, are we out of time? Okay, this is going to take a couple of minutes. This is going to take, this will be fast. Um, so that was the Global Warming Hot Yoga Studio. The last project I want to leave you with is the Kitty AI, uh, Artificial Intelligence for Governance. And, um, this project is also uh, connected to, uh, you know, the rise of artificial intelligence, obviously, but how it's represented culturally as well. So uh, big data, artificial intelligence, effective computing, which is the next new thing in the horizon. Uh, we'll have motion chips in our mobile phones, dot, 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 and democracy or uh, lack thereof, the failure of democracy. So. Um, I was looking at, um, oh, before we start this, uh, I was looking at IBM and uh, IBM's Watson, and I was uh, doing a reading of their advertising campaign, um, uh, Outthink, and uh, although Watson is represented as an icon that just kind of like moves and it has a male voice, it doesn't necessarily have a face. But in their campaign, uh, uh, IBM was using all these like, uh, you know, racially varied, ethnically varied, uh, but curated, well curated uh, faces. Uh, you know, I'll think competitors, I'll think old school to like uh, hint at different functions that Watson could provide. So while looking at this, I started thinking to myself, what about this? What if? we had an AI that had the emotional intelligence of a cat, <laughs> which also is a governor that lives on your mobile phones to serve you forever. 
Now, I'm going to uh, suffer from the lack of sound, but I'm going to play the first couple minutes of the film. Well, actually, that makes 15 human years for a cat, so perhaps I wasn't that young. We were all terrified, men, woman, cat, dog, child, kitten, all of us, in hindsight. The crisis and Maya was almost as terrifying as World War II in that its emotional impact on our collective consciousness was significant. At least to us millennials, who have been very well isolated from concepts like scarcity and frugality to the shelter. We had experienced violence, but mostly from video games or CGI-heavy horror movies. We had experienced loss, but only when we lost our iPhones or broke up with our swipe right girlfriends. We had experienced chaos, but only in our desktops or our bedrooms. The very first incident happened in Barcelona. A regular traffic jam on the way to the airport turns into a mass hysteria triggering gridlock at 45 degrees Celsius in the shade within four hours, more than 100 people die. One Spaniard even smashes his head into a Hummer's front window, cracking his skull open. Someone should have told him that a Hummer is practically an invincible war machine. So the cat speaks and takes you to this journey uh, on how she was generated uh, uh, by her grand-grandmother and all the artificial intelligences that accompanied that. So a couple principles of the Kitty AI uh, is inspired by the saying, uh, I am the state or I am the nation, uh, Louis XIV, France, and uh, the Kitty AI is the state. It's a very good, uh, uh, you know, reincarnation of Louis XIV, actually. So, what is this kid looking at? What is this kid looking at, actually? What could it be looking at? Kitty porn. Pardon me. I said kitty porn, but I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> mm, prob well, so in this world, the, the this kid is looking at the Kitty AI. So do these kids, because Kitty AI lives on your mobile phones. And uh, you will be able to download it if you're a citizen of the Kitty AI. It, it has a database, uh, up to 3 million citizens. So it will govern a territory and you'll have to register to be a citizen of the Kitty AI. And when you become a citizen, sh uh, she will love you. She will be downloaded on your phone and you would be able to, you know, communicate with the Kitty AI through mobile devices. Uh, it employs networked intelligence, so these are some of the other AIs that it uh, cooperates with. Uh, for instance, STCN is one of the oldest AIs in this narrative. It's the self-driving car network, <laughs> which later turns into a wildcat. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is something. We are using all these artificial intelligence networks to, you know, do the whole self-driving cars and many other systems that are invisible to us. But uh, over time, all these uh, artificial intelligences start gaining this emotional intelligence and this identity that comes with it. Lucy Purr, for instance, is an AI that uh, detects the citizens in Europe because Europe wants to stop the refugee crisis, so they start dermally tagging the citizens. And Lucy Purr is in, in charge of like who is in, who is out. And um, Panther is a, a really good one that takes care of waste, dot, dot, dot. So that's, those are Kitty AI's friends. Uh, now a quick chart to compare the Kitty AI, the, the governor from the future, to a regular politician. Uh, Kitty AI is attentive uh, because it's on your phone. You can reach Kitty AI immediately. Uh, a regular politician doesn't care. Kitty AI is available, again, um, almost omnipresent, uh, whereas a regular politician would limit it to zero availability if you want to talk with them. Again, uh, Kitty AI offers two-sided communication. If you tweet, if you send a message, it will respond to you, whereas a regular politician would tweet a lot but won't 
you know, respond to your tweets at all. Uh, Kitty AI speaks machine language uh, plus all the languages spoken by its citizens in its database, right? Um, the other one barely speaks English. Uh, Kitty AI looks like a kitten. Uh, yes. <laughs> now the list goes on. We're not done yet. Um, it lives on your mobile devices, lives in Trump Tower, or doesn't use White House, even doesn't use Hot White House as much. Uh, so the most important thing about Kitty AI is it's an you know, AI with emotional intelligence, so it can love. Uh, Donald Trump can love himself. Uh, Kitty AI is an example of applied micro-democracy. What does it mean? Let's say you're a citizen and you saw a hole on your street and someone fell on it and you can tweet or talk to Kitty AI about this. And if a hundred other people uh, complain about the same thing, Kitty AI will listen and fix that hole, save that person. Uh, whereas the other one is abstract macro-democracy. So you vote and then there's this really long time where you have to uh, suffer through the effects of your vote and then uh, your needs won't be responded to or attended to immediately. Uh, it's, uh, Kitty AI is a doer. Because remember all the other uh, AI cats, they're always working. The other one is a talker. Kitty AI is a cute pussy cat, whereas Donald Trump <laughs> grabs you by the pussy. <laughs> all right. Um, on that sweet note, I'm going to summarize. We talked about the tick and the notion of this perceptual bubbles. So that was umwelt. Uh, we talked about causality and how imperceptibility breaks causality. Things that fall beyond our umwelt are not perceivable by us. Therefore, we don't have the regular cause and effect systems at work. And then we talked about the kitty AI. All right. One last word. Um, because this is a talk that I'm giving here, and I you know, teach here and work here, and this is the design department, um, we have an immense power uh, to change or to, to, to inform the way people perceive and sense. Uh, we have an immense power in terms of affecting people's umwelt. And with great power comes great responsibility. So I showed you some examples of the things I've tried uh, with my time. What can you do to fix causality as a designer or an interface designer or an HCI person or a cultural producer? All right. Yes.